All right, so I'm going to bring up the blog book here. All right, so you should be taking a look at a uh, website here, our Verge Permaculture website. I put the link up in the show notes um, in the YouTube channel. So I will just, uh, if you'd like to follow along, you're more than welcome to. Um, you'll notice at the top of the page there that we've got the free blog book available. So if you want your own copy of this program, you're welcome to download that and follow along. Um, we've got our most popular blogs in this book. And so this is one of those most popular blogs on passive solar greenhouse design. So today what's gonna happen is I'm gonna go through a series of, um, or sorry, I'm gonna go through the blog. And then uh, at the end, we'll leave some time for Q and A and you can uh, ask whatever questions you would like about uh, passive solar greenhouses. I'm just gonna adjust my camera just a little bit here, guys. There we go. <clears throat> All right, let's get into it. I'm just curious uh, how many people here have um, built or are interested in building a passive solar greenhouse before we get started. And while you guys are answering that, uh, Shannon asked a question, what happened with last Wednesday night? Was it canceled? Well, Shannon, we had a bit of a sound issue, uh, which it sounds like we're having again today. And so I'll have to check in on that and see what's going on. Um, and so part two will actually be happening this Wednesday night, part two of the introduction to permaculture at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Um, again, if you guys want notifications with regards to what we're going to be talking about uh, live on a particular week, you can actually go to our website. We've now got a listing page uh, on our website, and I'll just show you where that is. So if you go into resources uh, and then video, open link in new tab. You'll see that we have all of our live sessions uh, available to you guys in terms of what we're going to be talking about. So today we're talking about tips for successful passive solar greenhouse design. Wednesday we're doing part two of the introduction to permaculture starting at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And Friday at 3 p.m. we're going to talk about tips for successful rainwater harvesting design. So you can always go to this webpage, vergepermaculture.ca forward slash video, and you'll get all the latest updates with regards to what we're doing live for any particular week. So take a look at that. Hi, Tranquil, nice to meet you. Thanks for introducing yourself. Okay guys, so let's get into the content here. So first off, um, you'll notice that there's a passive solar greenhouse there in that image. And that's the passive solar greenhouse that we've been playing around with the last decade. And believe me, I've made a ton of mistakes on this greenhouse, but the mistakes that I made were the best things that I ever did uh, because it's allowed me to really fine tune how we go about designing passive solar greenhouses. Um, and so we'll talk about a couple of those mistakes, but mostly I want to talk about the things that you need to do in order to make sure that you don't make those mistakes in the first place. So one of the things that we got right, right from the beginning was getting the orientation correct. So this is the only location on my property that I could actually uh, orient a greenhouse such that it was facing towards south. Now, obviously in the Northern Hemisphere, you want your greenhouse facing towards south, but I get a lot of clients talking to me saying that you know, are concerned about whether or not they can not they can get the greenhouse specifically to the south. And it turns out that as long as you're within 45 degrees of south, you're still gonna be okay for your greenhouse. Um, and the ideal orientation for your greenhouse is actually slightly to the east, believe it or not. In fact, having your greenhouse 15 degrees to the southeast, so 15 degrees off of south towards the east is the optimal greenhouse orientation. Now you might wonder why that is, and the answer is that you want um, the early morning sun in your greenhouse. And so having it slightly oriented to the east is gonna give you that uh, sunlight. Um, and that's because it's the coldest time of the day, like right in the morning there. And so you actually want that early morning heat, early morning light. Um, and then by orienting it slightly to the east, we're actually gonna reject some of the light in the afternoon. And so typically afternoon sun is when we're going to have the most heat in the greenhouse already. And so we don't want to add any additional energy into that space uh, because it can end up being detrimental. Generally speaking, when your greenhouse goes above 26 degrees Celsius or probably about 80 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, plants really start to get unhappy, at least a lot of them. And so we, we generally don't want to have that really hot afternoon sun if we can help it. So orientation is really important. 
So greenhouse tip number two, um, use a 70% transmissivity glazing. Now there's lots of glazing materials out there. And generally speaking, what we recommend is using a polycarbonate, which is a plastic or Lexan based uh, glazing material. Now, whatever you end up using, you wanna make sure that at least 70% or more of the light is actually getting through. Now, one of the challenges that you have with greenhouse design is that um, the glazing itself has this funny relationship. We've got this funny relationship between um, glazing material, R value, and transmissivity. So generally speaking, as you increase the transmissivity of um, greenhouse glazing material, what you're gonna end up doing is reducing the R value. And so it's a very interesting relationship in that regard. So higher transmissivity, more light coming through, means that you're also losing more thermal energy. Lower transmissivity, generally speaking, um, so less light coming through means that you're losing less thermal energy. And so it's this interesting um, trade-off, if you will, between heating your greenhouse and lighting your greenhouse. So if you've ever gone to commercial greenhouses or spaces like Southern Alberta where we've got massive, massive commercial greenhouses, what you'll notice is that they don't use passive solar greenhouses. And here's the reason why. Light, which is much harder to generate than heat, um, at least more expensive from an um, electricity perspective, is the weak link of most year-round greenhouses. And so they will opt to waste enormous amounts of heat by creating these greenhouses that have glass all around them um, in exchange for just dumping tons and tons of heat into the actual greenhouse itself. So um, what we're saying with a passive solar greenhouse is that we actually uh, want to optimize between both light and heat. And when you live in a climate that gets really cold like ours, um, we get down to as low, not always, not every year, but as low as minus 40, uh, you know, we definitely want to make sure that we're holding some of that heat in. Now, one of the characteristics of our climate here in Alberta is that we actually have very sunny winters. And so when you've got sunny winters and, that are cold, then a passive solar greenhouse is a good bioregional adaptation for uh, the greenhouse itself. So when you're looking to buy your glazing, make sure that you look at the transmissivity uh, on the actual manufacturer's um, specifications. Now there are other glazing materials, and if you haven't seen it yet, we actually have uh, five different passive solar greenhouse case studies on our website, which you can get access to. Um, and I'll make sure that I put that link in the show notes at the end of um, my talk here once we're into the Q&A session. And so if you wanna see how other people are designing their passive solar greenhouses, you might find that really useful. Greenhouse tip number three, insulate, insulate, insulate. So in cold climates, insulation is the name of the game. And generally my rule of thumb is to start with an R value of 20. Now, one of the things that I built last year was a passive solar greenhouse um, design tool and we use it to design passive solar greenhouses. And one of the things that we get out of this tool is an understanding of how much heat the greenhouse is using. So we can, or losing I should say. And so we can use this tool to optimize the amount of insulation that we choose to use in the greenhouse. So we're not over insulating, but we're also not under insulating. That greenhouse will actually, sorry, that greenhouse tool will actually be for sale on our website a little bit later this year. Um, and if you're on our newsletter, you're gonna be able to find out about it. It really streamlines the design of passive solar greenhouses. Um, generally speaking though, we say that you should start with an R value of 20. It's a pretty good number to start with. Um, I wouldn't want my house built out of R20. I'd want it much uh, higher in my ecosystem, but for a greenhouse, it's a really great place to start. Uh, tip number four, ventilate, ventilate, ventilate. And so, you really cannot overventilate a greenhouse. I can't stress that enough. Pretty much every greenhouse operator that I go and talk to says the same thing. And I think the best way to explain this is that when you're looking at uh, a greenhouse, a passive solar greenhouse, and you compare it to a passive solar house, passive solar houses try to um, use between 10 and 20% of the southern glazing surface um, or sorry, they try and glaze between 10 and 20% of the glazing surface on the south side 
um, of, of the wall. And so when you think about a passive solar greenhouse, the glazing surface area or percentage on the south wall is 100%. Now, anything over 20% in a passive house is actually going to cause that house to overheat, even in the wintertime. And so you can imagine how much energy these passive solar greenhouses are receiving from the sun. And they have to because plants need light. And so the overheating is an inevitability because we can't diminish the amount of light coming in. And if you'll notice on my greenhouse, I've actually got an overhang just on the top there. Um, when I was designing this greenhouse, I was working for a low energy house builder here in Calgary. And I hadn't designed any passive solar greenhouses at that point. So I thought it would be a really good idea to put an overhang on the top of the greenhouse, both for a drip edge, but also to help to prevent some of that overheating in the middle of the summertime. But in doing so, I ended up dramatically reducing the productivity of my plants in the months where they should be the most productive um, by diminishing some of that sun. So I highly recommend not putting an overhang over top of your passive solar greenhouse. Um, and so the better option is to add more ventilation and let all the light in that you can. Um, so that's one of the mistakes that I made and going forward, you'll notice on our new passive solar greenhouse designs that we're not uh, glazing the, or sorry, we're not putting overhangs over top of the glazing like we did in the past. Tip number five is get the soil right. So our greenhouse is built on top of a concrete pad, which was just one of the constraints that we had on this particular property. And I didn't have the heart to uh, uh, dig the concrete up and so because it's perfectly good concrete and this greenhouse might end up moving somewhere else in the future. So what we did was we actually built an insulated floor and then filled the greenhouse with wicking beds which has been pretty good. However going forward if I ever build another greenhouse again which I will um, I will inevitably plant the greenhouse into the ground and allow the greenhouse plants to have access to real soil. It's really crucial. Uh, one of the worst things that you can do is give plants a suboptimal soil. And when, by suboptimal, I mean not giving plants access to the subsoils, um, which are the, the clay, sand, and silt that exist below the topsoils. Now, the clay, sand, and silts that exist in, below the topsoils where all the nutrients are. And because we're creating an artificial environment inside of a greenhouse, your plants are going to be susceptible to disease if you're not giving them access to really good soil. So the best soil they can get access to is soil in the ground. Wicking beds are great for low uh, you know, evaporative losses and water efficiency and all that stuff, but you really cannot build, um, you really cannot beat growing plants in real soil. So that's my recommendation. Don't grow and raise beds if you can help it, grow in the earth. Number six, get the irrigation right. Plants in greenhouses are very sensitive to the amount of water that you give them. Uh, and they'll actually get into kind of habits, if you will. And so if you're not being consistent with your watering, you can end up causing problems within your plant system. So make sure that you are learning how to water plants. I know that sounds crazy, but um, there actually is an art to watering. And if you overwater, you'll stress the plants out, the soil will go anaerobic. If you underwater, the plants get stressed out. And the minute you have a stressed out plant in a greenhouse, especially one that's not being grown with subsoils below its feet, you inevitably end up getting plant diseases. And that's a, a real problem in greenhouses. I mean, we're, again, we're creating this artificial environment. And so you want to make sure that you're giving your plants the best chance of success, making the healthiest plants possible, because those are going to be the ones that are most resistant to plant pathogens and plant diseases. Um, so really get good at irrigating and how you water, when you water, those sorts of things. The last tip before we go into the Q&A session um, is tip number seven. So you want to get the right thermal mass. And so thermal mass in a passive solar greenhouse is really important. You'll see a lot of greenhouses that use water. Water is a great thermal mass. Um, however, it's not great if you're going to let your greenhouse go below zero because now that water can freeze and potentially rupture whatever vessel you've got it in. Um, I've seen greenhouses with fish tanks, which are very effective. Those fish tanks are kept above zero. And so the fish tank itself resists uh, thermal shift, essentially. So it's a massive thermal battery. You'll notice in ours, we have a rocket mass heater, which is primarily made out of clay and sand or cob. And this has been a really effective thermal mass for us. And so thermal mass in the summertime will help keep it cool during the day. 
but will also release heat at night back into the greenhouse, keeping it warm at night. Uh, it works both in the summertime as a, a flywheel effect as well as in the wintertime. Uh, generally speaking, the reason that I don't use water in greenhouses is that even though concrete is less effective as a thermal mass, um, it's still, uh, you, you can just add more concrete to it. So generally speaking, we say you add four or five times the amount of concrete that you would water. And by concrete, you can use cob, you can use rock, you can use any material kind of like that, um, you know, as a thermal mass within your system. So if you wanted to add 10 liters of um, 10 liters or three gallons of water, you'd end up adding, you know, somewhere between 40 and 60 kilograms or 80 to 100 pounds of concrete or rock in, to get the equivalent thermal mass in your space. It's all going to depend on, on what your goals are and how you've set the inside of the space up. But thermal mass is very important. You want to make sure that you properly mass the building. So hopefully you found that interesting. There's obviously a lot more to passive slur greenhouse design than that. One thing that I'd recommend at the bottom of the blog, uh, you'll notice when you're on the website that you've got the access, uh, access to an interview that I did with Diego Footer from Permaculture Voices um, on passive solar greenhouse design. So you can take a listen to that. It's a much longer um, interview. Um, I'm totally open to answering questions for the remainder of the hour, which gives us 40 minutes. So I can just bring the live chat over here. And if, as you guys have questions, you're more than welcome to, uh, to ask them and I will do my best to answer them. Okay, so Little Brother asks, would you recommend an extra plastic layer over the interior glazing during the winter? Uh, potentially, you, again, you have to be careful that you're not uh, diminishing too much of the light coming in. So uh, if you're new to gardening, you'll know that when you uh, add additional glazing layers, you can end up diminishing the, the um, the light and and as a gardener who's growing seedlings knows that if you don't give enough light to your seedlings they get really long and leggy uh, plants really need to have an abundance of light in order to thrive so you can try it i would try it on a small section of your greenhouse first and see how that affects the plants and if they start getting leggy then you know they're not getting enough light there are also other types of plants that you can grow that are not photosensitive uh, so they're less susceptible to low light conditions in the winter time um, which may be the ones that you want to focus on if you do put that extra layer in there. Ah, what is the purpose of having your lean-to roof in an A-shape? So the lean-to roof, um, let me just uh, actually draw this out for you. That'll probably be an easier um, representation of what we have actually going on here. So I'll just get my uh, illustration going here and then you can take a look. So the question was, why do I have the specific lean-to um, shape? And so the shape of our greenhouse is like so. And we've got vents right here. And this is the glazing surface right here. Is that in focus, guys? Let me try and see if I can get this in focus a little bit better. So we've got um, our roof, we've got our insulated floor as we talked about, okay, we've got um, a couple of other features here which we can talk about if there's interest, um, eaves trough on the back. So the question was, why the A-frame? So when passive solar greenhouses were first being experimented with in the 1970s, the uh, the use of polycarbonate was not super prolific. And so 
the only real glazing material that they had access to was glass. And so I actually ended up getting, and I'll just bring it up, um, I'll bring it up at the end of the, the class here. There's a passive solar greenhouse book that you can get on Amazon or used bookstores for two or three dollars. And um, basically they recommended that the glazing surface angle right here be perpendicular to the angle of the sun in the month that you wished to grow. So that's great if you're using glass as a glazing surface. But the neat thing with polycarbonate is that it diffuses the light. And so what that means is that as light goes through polycarbonate, what happens is it splits the light up into separate streams. Whereas with glass, if the light is not hitting the surface perpendicular, you end up getting a whole bunch of refraction, sorry, reflection, and, refla and refraction. which is essentially bending of light. And so um, with polycarbonate, the glazing angle is no longer all that important, but I didn't know that going into this. And so it took some hard lessons uh, to learn all of that. So now our glazing um, angle and our greenhouses look more like this. And we have a vent wall right here. We have a knee wall right here. And then another vent wall in the back. And so the angle of this glazing now is dictated more um, by snow load. than by solar angle. And the reason that works really well is that it doesn't matter what sun angle we've got because of the way that polycarbonate diffuses light, you get really great light distribution in a greenhouse when you're using polycarbonate. Yeah, polycarbonate is expensive, but it lasts for 15 years. So the other alternative, um, which we detail out in lots of detail, is the uh, Curtis Stone's greenhouse, which I've got a case study for in Kelowna, BC. Uh, and he uses just a standard um, double wall inflated poly wall and uh, claims that the poly um, material will actually last for seven years if it's not disturbed, uh, which is a really economic option for glazing. And you'll get a lot of the same benefits of diffuse light that you'll get with polycarbonate for a fraction of the fee. Okay, let's go back to the questions. Okay, so the next question is, I'll have a clean slate for land, so where do I begin? Well, um, you've got two options. Um, I guess it's a good time for me to plug our Passive Solar Greenhouse course. We do have a Passive Solar Greenhouse course coming up, and I will be notifying everybody on our list about this uh, in the next month. Um, so if you want to start from scratch, um, that's a good place to start. Uh, but basically, uh, if you're familiar with permaculture and you're looking for a good place to site a greenhouse, greenhouses need a lot of attention. So you want to you want to bring it in close to your center of energy. You don't want it to be too far away from from where you're actively working. So pretty close to your house. Um, again, you want to make sure it's oriented to south or slightly to the east. Um, and then you got to have to figure out what your dimensions are going to be. And so with a passive solar greenhouse. Um, we typically will start with the aspect ratio. So the aspect ratio is essentially how wide and deep the greenhouse is. So my greenhouse itself is, um, I'll just show you the, my greenhouse itself is 10 feet uh, deep by 20 feet long. 
Um, we work in a greenhouse in Invermere that is uh, 3,000 square feet, and so it's 200, sorry, 2,000 2, square feet, 200 feet long. Or is it 100 feet? I can't remember the dimensions now, actually. Maybe it's 100 feet, but the point is it's 2,000, but it still has about a 2 to 1 aspect ratio. So you'll notice that um, 2 to 1 aspect ratio basically means it's twice as long as it is wide, which is why we say 2 to 1. So the first thing you have to decide is the aspect ratio of the actual greenhouse itself. Once you've got that aspect ratio determined, then you actually have to go in and figure out what the cross section is going to look like. And so, like we showed you guys earlier, the cross section for our current greenhouse looks like this. Something along those lines. Um, you can also use a cross section that looks like this. Almost a shed style roof with a vent wall in the front. Um, and so then once you have your aspect ratio and you have your cross section, then from there you can figure out what the three-dimensional shape is going to look like. And once you've got the three-dimensional shape, then you can start to specify things like insulation, where doors are going to go, where vent walls are going to go in the front what type of glazing material to use, how you're gonna support that glazing, what kind of trusses, um, and all of those finer little details. But the first thing is figuring out where you're gonna site the greenhouse itself. Hi Rob, can you recommend types of insulation and structure that have low embodied energy and low toxic materials? So Sean, it's gonna depend on where you are and the type of materials that you wanna use. Um, in Canmore, Alberta, there's actually a passive solar greenhouse that was built by a colleague of mine um, that's made out of straw bales. And again, as long as the greenhouse has the right ventilation, um, and so there's, a, there's enough air movement in there, it shouldn't be detrimental to the straw bales themselves. And that would be a low embodied energy, high insulation, and then the um, cob on the inside of those straw bales are actually going to uh, help with the thermal mass of the building itself. So highly recommend checking that out. We'll be doing a case study uh, of that greenhouse on our website in the next six months. So keep an eye on our passive solar greenhouse case studies. Um, next question. Isn't it important to have uh, a thermal mass, have a thermal mass dark color to warm in sunlight passively? Yeah, totally. <clears throat> So the color of your thermal mass is going to dictate how much energy that thermal mass is going to absorb. And you're absolutely right. If you've got a dark color, it's going to absorb more energy than if you have a light color. But here's the interesting drawback. And there's always trade-offs, if you will, for any of these design decisions. As you use lighter colors, you end up getting more reflectivity. As you use darker colors, that reflectivity, reflectivity goes down. And what we noticed is that um, with your thermal mass, you want to use something in the middle. So you want to use something that's going to absorb energy, which is like a rough surface, relatively dark, but not so dark that it's going to absorb all of the light. You're always balancing light and thermal energy in a greenhouse. And so it's best to try and build something, trial it. And if you need to uh, add, make it lighter or make it darker, you can always do so with paint. But generally speaking, yeah, we try and stick slightly more on the darker side, but not going straight to black, if that makes sense. Ah, Josh, great question. Isn't that dumping water and snow against your house? It does look like that, doesn't it? But let me just go back and share my screen um, again so you can take a closer look at that greenhouse. And I'll see if I can zoom in on this image here. And if not, I can find another image for you to take a look at. Um, so let's just do this. There's actually, it doesn't look like it, but there's actually a, an air gap in between there and we've got an eaves trough right there. So believe it or not, it actually does not dump water or snow onto the garage itself. In an ideal world, I would have built this greenhouse uh, further away from the garage, but the city would only let us build it in this specific location. So this greenhouse is actually certified as a garage. There's no greenhouse subclassification in Calgary. 
and I had to be a certain distance away from my fence uh, <clears throat> because they didn't want me peeping on my neighbors. At least that's how the by bylaw is written. You can only have buildings with windows facing your neighbor's yard within a certain distance from the fence line. Um, and the idea is that you could be in your greenhouse or structure peeping on your neighbors. However, they don't take into account that this is actually a garage on this side and that you can't really get a clear view out of polycarbonate. So anyhow, long story short, this was the only place that we could put it. Um, I was a little bit concerned about water and snow kind of going into the garage there, but we've got a really great uh, siding on here and uh, all the water gets collected in an eaves trough and then fill, uh, sent off to a rain tank behind the actual garage itself. Great question. Next question from Darla. Uh, your greenhouse is a lean-to. Do you think this is best? If, if you do build a standalone, would you insulate the north side with a non-glazing material? So Darla, actually my greenhouse is not a lean-to. Um, a lot of people think that it is because of how, again, how close it is to the actual garage itself. It is a standalone greenhouse. And so passive solar greenhouses, as a definition, generally have insulation on the east side, the north side, and the west side. Um, and then the knee wall, which is the, the wall right on the front here, is also typically insulated as well. Um, and so hopefully that answers your question. The next question from Sean, how often do you have to replace polycarbonate? I imagine glass to be much longer lasting. That's another great question, Sean. Polycarbonate lasts for around 15 to 20 years, depending on how intense the sun is. Um, and you would think that glass would last longer, but again, in our ecosystem, we actually end up having massive, massive hail issues. Uh, we live in one of the most violent hail belts in North America. And so polycarbonate actually holds up a lot uh, better to hail than the glass does. So I highly recommend polycarbonate for that reason. Even greenhouse poly might not be a great option for our ecosystem for that exact reason. So something to think about. Now glass that's tempered could resist hail damage possibly. Um, however, single pane tempered glass uh, has almost no R value. So something to keep in mind when you're uh, thinking about the glazing material that you end up choosing. I'm going to keep going on here with questions, guys, but I'd really love it if you guys could hit the like button if you're finding this interesting um, and beneficial. Uh, it helps the channel to track, and uh, it's great to see that we're getting feedback on stuff that you guys are finding valuable. So if you can just go to the bottom of the video there and hit the like, I'd really appreciate it. Um, if you know anybody else that would benefit from the last uh, 20 minutes of the call, please feel free to share this on social media as well. Uh, next question, polycarbon is pretty expensive. Yeah, it is expensive, AN, but um, again, you're only going to have to change it every 15 years. And I want to kind of address this really expensive notion of passive solar greenhouses because they are expensive. Um, a buddy of mine, Curtis Stone, who lives in Kelowna, uh, has a passive solar greenhouse that is three times the size of this. So it's about a thousand, actually, no, it's five times the size of this. It's a thousand square feet, basically. And again, I've got a case study of that up on our website, which I will put in the show notes below this video uh, towards the end of today's class. And his um, greenhouse has the ability to produce up to $9,000 of microgreens per week. So he spent $30,000 building his greenhouse. Um, and now he can produce between one and $9,000 of microgreens for his local market in Kelowna per week. So he basically can pay off the greenhouse in less than three months. So it depends on what your goals are. If your goals are to start a business with this greenhouse, um, the expense is pretty small if you choose the right operation to run within the greenhouse. If your greenhouse is specifically just for hobby purposes, yeah, it's going to be a little bit more expensive than, a, um, you know, than just building a garden in your backyard. But the interesting thing is, is that when I look at commercial uh, A-frame greenhouses, like the conventional ones, the the um, conventional greenhouses that you see all over the world, uh, you know, these passive solar greenhouses are not that much more expensive than a brand new conventional greenhouse when you look at the size and, and the functionality. So um, the expense is relative. It depends on what you're going to do uh, inside of the actual greenhouse itself.
Okay, so David, uh, David asks, hi, I missed the beginning, so may, you may have covered this, but given the importance of high transmittent glazing, would you recommend a roll-up suspended insulation blanket instead of double glazing? David, I'd actually recommend both. This is a fantastic question. Now, there's two ways to go about insulating the glazing on your greenhouse. So a standard polycarbonate, and let me just bring this uh, screen share back up again so that I can show this to you guys. So a standard polycarbonate has about an R value of, depending on the style that you use, but R2. Okay, now all the other walls on the greenhouse themselves have an R value of, like we said, about 20. And so 90% of the energy leaves the glazing surface at night. So if the sun is shining during the day, the greenhouse itself, in spite of how cold it is outside, will actually warm up. It's, it's amazing. I've had minus 20 Celsius outside and we get plus 20 Celsius inside. So that's like minus 10 Fahrenheit, I believe, if my uh, memory is serving me correctly, and 72 Fahrenheit on the inside. Amazing temperature difference. But as soon as the sun goes down at nighttime, uh, the temperature inside of here drops pretty rapidly because so much energy is being lost out of this glazing. Remember, R2 is a tenth of R20, and so this is where the weak link in the greenhouse actually is. So when you're designing a greenhouse, there's two ways to put thermal curtains onto a greenhouse. Number one is to, we'll just draw another greenhouse here. So number one, we've got trusses in the bottom. is you could actually roll the insulation out over the top. Okay, so we can insulate that. And even if you use a cheap construction tarp, which has an R value of two, you've taken the glazing surface, which also has an R value of two, and you've doubled it, which basically means because of the way that heat transfer works in this particular type of building, what you've done is you've halved the heat loss. Okay, it's amazing how, how quickly that works. So just something as simple as a construction tarp. I don't like putting the insulation on the outside um, because what can happen is if you end up in a situation with freezing rain, which has happened in our climate to a, a person that I'm aware of using passive solar greenhouses, the insulated tarp is not removable, which means that you will not be able to get light into your actual greenhouse and your crops die. They can't live without light. Mm -hmm. So you're far better off to have an insulated tarp on the inside and then run it along the trusses on the bottom which then keeps the heat in and again doubles the insulative value and therefore halves the heat loss coming out of the greenhouse itself. Yeah, AN. So he's talking about how Curtis Stone first thought to buy polycarbonate too, but tried to save money. And in the end, it was a really good decision for him and for his context. And I think that the way he's set up his glazing surface makes a ton of sense. Riley, nice to see you, bud. Uh, been loving the series so far. I'm building some insulated, actively heated cold frames in the lower mainland, and I'm wondering if the insulative difference between um, corrugated and twin wall. So I'm assuming you mean corrugated polycarbonate and twin wall. So one layer of polycarbonate at best will probably be about an R value of one. And on the lower mainland, that might be enough. And I would experiment with both and see what works better. Um, Generally, twin wall is going to be 1.2 to, to 2, um, our value. So you could see a, a reduction of heat loss by a factor of 2. It's all going to depend on, um, you know, what your conditions are. So I try both. I suspect that twin wall is quite a bit less than, uh, sorry, single wall is much more, less money than twin wall. Steve Shelton, what is the yield or production from your greenhouse over winter? Great question, Steve. So um, because our greenhouse is not planted into the ground, again, if I go back a couple of uh, pages here, I'll just draw it again. We have this greenhouse that's on a foundation. 
and I did not want to take the concrete um, up. And so we built our greenhouse up on some uh, furring strips. And so we have an insulated floor, which means that it's not planted into the ground. And then we have the greenhouse right here, the roof right there. Insulated right here. We've got our glazing trusses and, and right there, and then our knee wall and vents right here. So because of that, it makes running this greenhouse year round really hard. Whereas when you plant it into the actual ground itself, sorry guys, I just realized that my, my image was not uh, showing to you here. And make sure that it's in the, the lens. There we go. So because it's not planted into the ground, this greenhouse actually can get quite cold in the winter time without additional a lot of additional heat. And so we've opted for using this for three seasons of the year. Um, whereas a greenhouse like this, which has insulation on the same walls but has a footing and is planted into the actual ground itself, is gonna be far easier to keep heated all year round. And so this would be more of a four season passive solar greenhouse. Uh, so during the three seasons, Steve, we have a lot of productivity out of here. In fact, the 200 square foot greenhouse itself actually will produce about as much as our larger garden on the outside. So it's still a very productive space. We just choose not to garden in, in the winter time. Okay, so Josh, if you prefer growing in the natural soil, what do you recommend for a foundation? Pole structure. Great question, Josh. Um, there's lots of different foundations that you can use, and it's also gonna depend on your property and your context. Um, I'm a really big fan of shallow footings, uh, shallow insulated footings. Um, and so if this is your greenhouse right here, Then I really like uh, ICFs on top of a strip footing. And then to protect the strip footing, I mean, our, our uh, frost can go down to six feet here. And so if this is an ICF block, Then having a horizontal projection of insulation, and this is gonna depend on your ecosystem in terms of how far this has to be. For us, it's R15 minimum, four feet out. And so what this does is it actually prevents the frost from going underneath the greenhouse itself. And this allows you to not have to build a full basement underneath. Um, so I'm a really big fan of that. Riley, uh, sorry about that. Hit the enter key while going for a uh, shift in that question. Good to see you too, Rob. Uh, seek to find, do you supplement heating in your greenhouse? We don't right now, um, although we do have a rocket mass heater in there, and so we can. Um, I found the rocket mass heater hard to keep going because the greenhouse is, again, it's, it's not far from my house, but it's far enough that I don't want to have to continually uh, keep the rocket mass heater lit all the time. So um, ideally we'd have either an electric or natural gas heated system in there just to supplement it and keep it above zero. But again, it all depends on what your goals are. And so for us in the winter time in our house, we actually grow microgreens inside. And then for three seasons of the year, we grow in our greenhouse, which is why we have you know red tomatoes right at the beginning of the summer. And we grow a lot of our hot season crops in our greenhouse. So everybody's context is going to be slightly different. Um, in a future greenhouse, I probably will heat it. Next question from Sean. Does a climate battery work well when growing in ground or do you plant the roots because, or do the plant roots cause trouble with the system? 
No, actually they don't. And so, and yes, uh, climate battery can work, although it's really hard for me to say exactly how well it can work. Um, there are a lot of claims out there about climate batteries and I can't make any specific claims because um, we need to do a little bit more research on them to know exactly what the coefficient of performance is. And so the COP, which stands for coefficient of performance, basically means um, if you use one unit of energy in your subterranean heating and cooling system or climate battery as some people refer to it, to blow the air down underground through these pipes, how much energy gets stored under the plants? Um, and that's what COP means. So I don't know how effective they are from a COP perspective. If the COP ends up being less than one, then what that means is that you're better off just to burn the electricity to heat the greenhouse as opposed to trying to store thermal energy underground. My suspicion is that this is greater than one, but I don't know how much. So your question about plant roots, um, what happens with these systems is they have what are called perforated big O. Um, and so perforated big O pipe is basically corrugated weeping tile with perforations in it. Okay, and so these come in different diameters. They're round. Okay, and I drew that wrong. And they've got holes in them. Okay, so typically these are used for draining sites. Okay, so we'll just draw a radius on here. Okay, so these pipes right here are these pipes right here. And so the air flows through here. And so the question was, well, what happens if these plant roots get into this system? And believe it or not, they won't because plants themselves actually air prune when they, the roots get into a dead air space, essentially. It's called air pruning. And so when a root tries to go into a pipe, so if this is a plant root, as soon as it no longer feels soil in here, it feels a void or it feels air, the plant self prunes the root right there and it won't let it go any further. So you might have a few root hairs in here, but it's really not a big deal. I wouldn't worry about it too much. Okay, Shannon had a question. Have you been able to source all your building materials locally or have you had to special order products from out of country or province? So Shannon, yeah, the thing that is tough to source locally is the polycarbonate. Um, there are people that, that carry it here in Calgary, uh, but generally speaking, that's manufactured in um, the United States. A lot of the, the wood for the buildings come from here. Um, I tend to use cooler panels for the exterior on my greenhouses, which can be very effective. Um, so you can get a lot of the building materials. And if you're just a little bit more conscientious about how you're gonna design the greenhouse, I'm sure you can get most of it from uh, your locale. Tranquil Garden, you missed mine. Sorry about that. Um, any special considerations in less sunny areas such as BC coast? Not much sun in winter, so not much chance for heat gain on most winter days. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in your ecosystem, I think you're calling in from Victoria, um, you just need to use a hoop house. I mean, it's the cheapest greenhouse. It'll give you that slight advantage when it does get below um, or right around zero, which it doesn't do too often on the West Coast. Um, and the reason a hoop house is the strategy that I'd recommend for you is because it's glazed on all surfaces. And so your weak link is actually not heat being on the West Coast, it's sun. And so a hoop house, you know, can be built for between $200 and $1,000, which is much less than a passive solar greenhouse. And um, it will give you the advantage that you need without having all this extra infrastructure. And I've actually seen people build hoop houses with subterranean heating and cooling systems underneath them. So um, basically they just put pipes again underground and circulate air in between that system. Um, what about Southern Ontario? So this is gonna be the last question that I've got uh, here guys. And um, so I'll just quickly answer that and then we'll do a closeout. 
Um, cold here, not as sunny as Cowtown. Yeah, totally. Um, so Southern Ontario can still benefit from a passive solar greenhouse like this. Um, and again, I would just be more cognizant of the types of plants that I grow inside of there. So you guys are dealing with the cold and cloudiness. So grow less plants that are, are less light sensitive in the um, winter time. You might even just transition the greenhouse over to um, a portion of it anyways to subtropicals or Mediterranean plants. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can use the space. You don't necessarily always have to just grow annual plants. Um, so you could, if you wanted to keep it heated, you could grow bananas in here. You could grow uh, fajoas. You could grow olives. Um, you could grow passion fruit. There's all sorts of plants that you have access to um, that you can put in a portion of the greenhouse. So maybe a part of the greenhouse becomes less productive, and then the other part is perennial. Figs is another good one. Um, you know, for a portion of your greenhouse. So it's all going to depend on your goals. Okay, guys. Well, thanks so much for showing up to the session. If you haven't hit the like button, please go ahead and do so if you found this interesting. Um, we're going to be uh, doing our live introduction to permaculture on Wednesday evening, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, part two. We had uh, great success with the last session. Um, you can watch part one up on YouTube. I'll make sure that I put some information in the show notes below. If you want to be notified about uh, when we go live, you can sign up for the Verge blog book, which has today's blog in it. And I'll also make sure that you get notified about future live events on our list. Um, lastly, I just want to make a couple more uh, plugs here. So we're going to be teaching a full detailed uh, design course on passive solar greenhouses. If you want to be notified about that, you're on our, our mailing list. Um, and lastly, we have a live permaculture design course happening in Invermere, BC. Please feel free to check that out on our website as well. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great Monday, and we'll talk to you real soon. Thank you.